Um, first of all, thank you for sticking with us. I know by the time it gets to three o'clock, everyone is kind of saturated and I get saturated. So um, uh, we want this to be as interactive as possible. This is not about us talking and saying this is the way it is. This is about a kind of debate of where we are at the moment. And I wanted to return to a point that Helen made at the beginning, um, that the internet started with a vision. And it was kind of a vision of equality, and it was a vision of something that was free and non-hierarchical, and a place where people could be themselves and use it for their own purposes. And it was to break down a lot of the social barriers that exist. I think it's really interesting being here today in 2018 and in this room and people who work to really help people with the internet and use it for those purposes, how much um, the words like fear came into the workshops this morning. So there's something that's kind of happened along that journey that has shifted from that original vision to a place which some stuff has crept in and now whether it's because of the way that it's diversified, whether it's because of um, media portrayal, whether it's because of experience, or whether it's because of lack of opportunity, that actually people are starting to doubt whether it was that vision in the first place. So I wanted to kind of start with that thought, but then lead on to where we are at the moment to really understand how, from the research that Tom and Lauren, who's here today, and Simeon have um, been doing with um, looking at the Ofcom data. What does um, it's not for me really mean? And if we think it's not about that, it's something that has been lost in that vision. How do we get it back and how do we understand that? So Tom, I wonder whether you could just dig behind kind of what you're finding. Yeah, sure. So um, hello, I'm Tom from the research team at Good Things Foundation. Um, before I start, I am going to apologise because I think in the, in the agenda it says that <laughs> Professor Simeon Yates would be on this panel. I'm neither Simeon Yates nor a professor. You might feel shortchanged, so um, I think the refund deadline's passed, so you're stuck with me. Anyway, um, so in your packs, um, what you have is something that looks like this. Um, and this is a summary of a bit of research that we've been doing at Good Things Foundation, working with Ofcom data, but also massive support from BT, to try and unpick the stuff when people say, I'm not online and it's not for me, what is actually going on behind the surface of that. Um, so what this shows really is just a summary of where we've got to at this point. We've identified four different types uh, of people talking about the types of support, whether it's an expense issue, whether it's just people saying it's not for me. Uh, and then on the flip side is really the bit about the equality issue. Um, so just to give you a quick summary of that, the biggest group of people we found so far in the research, and we haven't finished it, we're uh, just in the process of actually going out and speaking with real people rather than just delving into the, the sort of data and numbers stuff. Um, but the biggest group of those saying, it's not for me. And one of the challenges of that response is that it doesn't actually give you anything to go on to figure out what to do next with it. Um, so what we wanted to do with this research is really just understand what's on, underneath that and then start a conversation about designing interventions that really tackle those underlying reasons as opposed to just assuming it's about the skills or the access, uh, which follows on quite nicely from all the, the conversations that have been happening today. Um, so this is sort of the starting point of the conversation. I'm going to stop rambling from here on in, but really the, the stuff on the back around the equality. We are talking about uh, people with lower levels of education. We're talking about people in different social class groups. Um, and there are inequalities in non-users, in limited users, but also specifically in non-users saying it's not for me. and it's. Uh, about time I think we start to, to unpick that and understand it much better. Thank you. Um, I'd like to come to Tanya. So people who come in to A1 Community Works and say it's not for me, what do you see sitting underneath that and behind that? Very often it's fear. Um, when you're saying it's not for me, the answer I normally give is that's interesting. Um, just because that makes them sometimes tell me something more and they'll say things like, I'm too old, I'm stupid, I'm frightened, I'll break it. My standard response to I'll break it is, if you intend throwing at the wall, then it will break. But actually, we're insured, but please don't throw it at the wall. And how do you know it's not for you yet? You haven't tried it. Why not stay for half an hour and give it a go? What would be interesting to you? 
And it could be anything. It could be playing a game. It could be looking at where you used to live. So sometimes people will show me where they live or where they used to live, and I'll show them where I live or where the offices are. And then just wait and see. And sometimes I'll ignore them. A lady recently said to me at an outreach session, that's not for me. And I said to her, hmm, that's interesting. Well, you must be right then. Turned to the rest of the group and said, I'm going to show you how to play Flow. It's a really fun game. You'll enjoy doing it with other people. And five minutes later, a little voice said, can I do that? I could do that. And I went, yeah, have a tablet. <laughs> so you just have to try different things to find out more. Because we've all said it's about the people. And so you have to be really interested in them and not interested in delivering the digital skills. Um, I think that's a really nice point also to go to Jess now. Um, I, Ofcom's done a lot of work looking at kind of the attitudinal barriers that people have and for different groups. And when, it, from your more kind of in-depth work and uh, with people over time, what can you see that's kind of changing in terms of those kind of attitudinal barriers? Yeah, so, um, hi, by the way, I'm Jess. Um, I work in the media literacy research team at Ofcom. Um, and I manage our adults media literacy tracker. Um, so interestingly, over well, since um, we've been running our adults media literacy tracker since 2005, um, and since 2014, we haven't seen any change in the proportion of people who are offline. So our latest research in 2017, 12% of the UK are non-users of the internet. Um, and that varies quite a lot by who you are, older people and those in the DE socioeconomic group tend not to be online. And what's quite interesting in the most recent wave of data is um, the reasons for not going online vary by who you are. Um, so people of working age, so those under 65, tend are more likely than those over 65 to give reasons related to cost. Um, whereas those aged over 65 are more likely to say... I don't see the need, it's just not for me. Um, and then in terms of over time, we have seen a decrease in the proportion of people saying, I don't see the need, it's just not for me, because I think as more and more services become online and people see the kind of, from our qual research, we know that uh, people are seeing the benefits of being online and you know the amazing opportunities it can bring and Skyping, your grandchildren up in Scotland or, you know, calling your wife downstairs for a cup of tea, whatever it might be. Um, so we have, we've seen movements in, in kind of those types of motivations, yeah. So I just wanted to kind of use that as a point to now kind of go out to the audience and pick up on the two things. Could anyone tell me what they think is the most um, uh, effective motivation for people who really have... Um, at no reason at the moment or that you've come across in and when I know we've talked a lot about personal hooks um, but are there things that really really um, sit above what is individual or is it all about the person and I just wondered whether there were any thoughts in the audience yeah yes, I'd like to remind you But one of the things that has been mentioned so much um, this morning, this afternoon, is identity fraud. Right. So a lot of my students are very, very reluctant to actually maybe go online, do any online shopping. I think a couple of years ago, PayPal were hacked, yeah. right? Google left the van open, right? And I think there was something like 500,000, nearly a million email addresses and contact numbers um, were actually sort of leaked. I think that's one of the major reasons why people tell say it's not for me or I'm reluctant to actually go online. And does that resonate? I mean, it's coming back, I suppose, to this, this fear point, but um, I wonder whether the thing about personal data and whether there's anything also, whether Tom or Jess, um, just the prevalence of a focus on, on your data and kind of and either a misunderstanding of what, what, what that means and how you can protect it or, or just kind of how people then use it as a reason not to kind of engage because of that fear of what's going to happen. Yeah. Um, 
Do you want to go? I'll just make one quick yeah, point. Yeah. I think the one of the, the it's not for me group that we've identified is actually um, combines two responses in mm -hmm. the in the Ofcom survey. So one of them is people saying this really isn't a thing I want to engage with, but the other part of that is people expressing a fear of, of those things exactly. So uh, in the analysis we did with Professor Simeon Yates that I'm not, um, we uh, looked at associations between certain responses um, and people saying it's not for me was really, really closely linked with, with that risk thing. Um, so it's, it's sort of embedded in, in this, but it's really interesting that that's, that's actually what it's in reality as well. I have to use 7 zip, so I have to encrypt everything and actually have to password protect it. And simultaneously, they've got to have, let's say, the same um, media to be able to actually access that information. Mm. It's made it really quite difficult. Yeah. And Tanya, is that something that comes through in your work? Uh, sometimes, but I remind people who are telling me that they're not online that if they have a Tesco card or a co-op card or all those other things, they're already online and somebody else has an awful lot of data about them. And going online themselves might be one of the ways they could check that data. Um, I think you're probably going further than you need to with encryption. Um, I'm surprised how much I don't encrypt, but I don't keep a lot of stuff anymore that maybe I was sloppy about getting rid of. I do encrypt financial stuff and I do encrypt stuff that has people's names in when I'm dealing with organisations, but I use an encryption service that you don't need to have the service to be able to unencrypt it at the other end. So I think there are ways around it. Um, Yes. Okay. Yes, you, you can uh, actually pass protect Word documents to send them, but when you do PDF, there wasn't. We haven't got any converter, so we actually had to download Seven Zip, right? And Hackney Learning Trust is one of our main providers, so that they've got to have Seven Zip simultaneously. Although I have very few people coming into a centre, because ninety nine percent of what I do is outreach. Mm. Documents like that are sometimes things I will hand to them, or send by old fashioned post, yeah. just because it's easier. And so just because we have digital skills, and I do say this to learners, doesn't mean we have to go digital for everything. I just yeah. remember, I know there was one up in Kerm University or something that was done by ICO, which is the Information Commissioner's Office, and they were done for £200,000 because um, basically someone actually managed to hack their um, MOS system and steal mental health data. Thank you. And I think the maximum fine is actually £1.2 million. Yes, but I think the Commissioner has made it quite clear that for smaller groups like us, if we're doing the basic things we were asked to do, that we shouldn't be paranoid about it, because you're more likely to get an intervention that would be, how can I help you solve the problem, rather than a massive fine. Because if somebody tried to le levy a massive fine on A1 Community Works, we simply wouldn't pay it, we'd just be out of business. Um, I wanted. Oh, sorry. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Hafsha, and I'm from Smartlight. It's a centre in Birmingham. And those of you who know me know that my passion is intergenerational learning. Um, and one of the things that we we spoke about this this morning in the session about intergenerational learning. Um, and we also spoke about the huge divide and the gap that is now forming because children are learning about digital skills and they're obviously leaving the parents behind. But on the flip side of this, um, I had a situation this morning which was intrigues, intriguing um, and it made me sort of think actually this is the complete opposite of something that I do comp normally. So my daughter is currently working and living in London um, and here I am, I know about the tubes in London, that's fine, that's no problem at all. But she dis disempowered me this morning because this morning she said to me, so mom, where are you going today? And I said, well, I'm going here. You know, it's a BT centre, that's where I've got to get to. And next thing you know, she was on her phone, on her app, on the tube app. And when I looked at my WhatsApp messages, she had sent me a message detailing for me exactly how to get here, what tube I had to take, what line, and what station to get off at. And 
my immediate thought was, oh, thank you very much, you've made my life really easy. But at the same time, I thought, actually, you've taken that one little skill away from me. So I thought, this actually works really quite interestingly. So, yeah, I would like, yeah, because we were talking about this earlier, and um, I, I just wanted to get also a sense from people in the audience whether um, the people who you're supporting, it is part of the fear, is the fear of control um, that might be also taken away for you, how much digital is going to take, and following on from Ellen's points um, before, take that kind of um, problem solving and creative element away from you. So um, does, is there something where it is about this balance, where actually it's using digital in a way where you control the kind of process, the thought process that goes behind it, and you put it together, rather than someone doing it for you, or the technology dictating how you use it. Is that a fear that exists that once you go into the technological world, that that journey is, is something that you don't control anymore? Mm -hmm. um. I think, interestingly, from the research perspective, I think we had a quick conversation about it earlier, the, the, the link between the number of people, uh, number of children specifically you have in the home, um, making you less likely to be a non-user um, it's a double negative, I appreciate, and uh, that's been highlighted too, um, so we'll, we'll look at that. Um, but that's quite an interesting point because actually the, the Ofcom data is looking at adults specifically, so we will have not picked up on the stuff like um, the other way around where it's supporting adults. Um, but we have in the full report, and I should probably mention that the full report is on a link at the bottom here, um, the comms team will be happy, nodding, good. Um, that full report's in there, um, yeah, so you can see, see more on, on that kind of stuff. And I think it's something you mentioned as well that you'd found interesting about the findings. And yeah, definitely. I and mean, we know from kind of other research that we do that um, people learn new things from family and friends. That's the top place to go. So even if you say kind of, um, you know, do you want to go to Google or YouTube? So kids would go to YouTube and they would go to Google to learn new things. And as you get older, you're more likely to want to go to family and friends, either have that peer-to-peer -peer or even kind of like generational learning. So it is a really key source um, of learning. And perhaps it's something about, I think as a child, you maybe don't understand as much the benefit of teaching someone to do something themselves. So, you know, it's just easier for them to send you a picture of what you need to do rather than on the morning that you have to go and do it and they have to get to work or have it taking you through it. And it's kind of about maybe everybody teaching everybody else, you know, I need you to teach me and this is, this is how you can do it and this is how you can help me. I think one of the interesting things we find is the converse, that a lot of the work we do, particularly with older people, is because their family can't teach them. They, um, they go too fast, they do it for them, they want to help, they get emotionally involved. I am none of those things. I'm just there going, this is how you do it. If you need me to show you again, I can show you as many times as necessary. And the other reason people will say to me, I don't need it is, well, if I need to do that, I'll find a 10 year old. And as I have no children, I have to say, my personal experience is, there's never a 10 year old around when you really need them. You have to go out and book them. And then usually they want some form of payment from you for the service. And I, I approve the entrepreneurial spirit. Um, That's okay, I'll take the only that. Um, what I do uh, when I'm doing it is that I show them something and then I get them to do it on there. I say, right, I'm going to go back now and then you have a go. And if they still can't do it, I show them again and then I go back and I let them have a go and so on until I can see that they actually know what they're doing. I would say that, sorry, the one thing we don't do, I hope, um, with all due respect, is often teach. We empower. Um, when people say to me, I can do that, I don't need you any long, longer. I tend to think, job done. Um, I think... Um, Sorry, just to add to that mix as well, because um, I think it's really interesting. You, you, Tom, you were talking about double negatives, and I suppose this is a double negative situation here. Um, I always say, you know, parents need to be the biggest educators, because when we look at it, children spend what, 15% of their time at school. 
but really thinking about it now and having seen what we've seen today, I almost feel like, well, actually, it's not just parents who are the biggest educators, it's actually children as well. So really, we ought to be saying it's 15% of that adult's time that is spent away from their children. So really, it's that rich time when that family are together that real learning can take place. Um, just to kind of finish, for Tom, what's the next stage of the research? What does it now need to do? Obviously, you've come to this point where you're digging yeah. behind that key question, but what is the next stage that we can on? Yeah, so I think we've had conversations um, about the, the way surveys work generally and understanding the the landscape of digital exclusion. So we have different measures. We have the skills measure uh, that comes through the Lloyds um, CDI. Um, we have the ONS stuff around people who've never been online. Um, and this stuff as well, uh, that tells us a bit about the motivations. Um, I think to really understand what's going on and then to design interventions around that, we need to have better data. I'm bound to say that I've got data in my job title. Um, so I have to justify my own existence, I guess. Um, but I think we need to better ask questions um, that really get to the, the level of how people actually talk about it. So rather than it just being it's not for me, we've understood that it's a fear issue. Uh, and then we ask questions accordingly in surveys so we get a better national picture of, of what people are saying. Um, so that's like a, a long-term goal for this, I guess. Um, but I, I do think that should be a recommendation is thinking about how we collect information around people's motivations and, and aspirations, uh, which leads into the, the, the kind of outcome stuff that Ellen was talking about as well. Um, Thank you. Okay, thank you all very much. Yeah,